Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's installment of the Free Press Community Review's weekly video update. My name is John Kendall. I am the editor of the Free Press Community Review's East and West Editions. I'm joined today by Caitlin Stryland, a reporter for the West Edition, and we're talking about the issues of November 2nd. And it's the week after the civic election and municipal elections around the province. And uh, Caitlin, why don't you tell our readers and viewers how you spent election night and uh, what you ended up reporting on? Exactly. So I went out at about uh, 8 p.m. ish on October 26, and I drove over to the St. James Ward, um, just sat in my car watching the poll numbers roll in. And it was kind of clear from pretty much from the beginning that Sean Dobson um, had a strong lead over uh, the other candidates. Um, so I was kind of parked halfway in between Sean Dobson and uh, Kelly Ryback's election night uh, headquarters. And when it was projected that Sean Dobson was going to be the next uh, the next councillor for St. James, I zipped over to his election headquarters, which was his home. Or actually, sorry, his mom's home uh, in the same neighbourhood as him in St. James. Um, so they had a nice little reception there, party at the house. Um, and yeah, I spoke to him about his reaction to this new position. Um, uh, as some may know, he was previously the city councillor for the St. Charles Ward before that was uh, dissolved to make way for the Charleswood, Tuxedo Westwood, and St. James Wards. I believe there was some. Uh, yes, that's, that's there was redistribution in, of wards uh, in 2018 uh, based on population, and so they moved some boundaries around to ensure that everything balanced. And then we emerged with those two new wards, St. James and uh, Charleswood, Tuxedo Westwood. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I got his reaction. Uh, he was very excited. All all his family members were there supporting him. And he just basically said he's ready to hit the ground running, has some ideas uh, he wants to bring to city council. Um, yeah, so I chatted with him. And then afterwards, I zipped over to Kelly Ryback's uh, election headquarters um, to chat with him about his, his uh, placing second, essentially, in the runnings. And of course, he was disappointed, but uh, was very grateful for the support he, he received from the community. Um, yeah. That's that was kind of my night. So I understand this week um, they are doing like the inaugur inaugural council meeting. Is that correct with uh, the new the new councillors? Yes, that's correct. The all the new councillors are, are uh, sworn in on uh, Tuesday, November 1st, which is actually the day that we're recording this. <laughs> and uh, it'll start actually in a few minutes from now as we record this. And uh, Sean will be sworn in as uh, the new councillor for St. James. And Sean is uh, one of two new city councillors who will be serving on this council. Um, the other is Evan Duncan, who was elected in uh, Charleswood Tuxedo Westwood to replace Kevin Klein, who of course uh, ran for mayor. Now the mayoral race, um, as you alluded to, uh, was won by Scott Gillingham, who was formerly the uh, city councillor for St. James. And Scott uh, becomes the mayor-elect of Winnipeg. Um, in a few moments from now, he will be the mayor of Winnipeg. And uh, the uh, um, new council and the new mayor will begin their uh, program of government almost immediately. In fact, there's another meeting next week at which they will determine uh, who will sit on the various committees of council. And uh, we'll see if uh, Sean Dobson in St. James and Evan Duncan in, in Charles Wood Tuxedo West with the two new councillors from the western portion of Winnipeg um, end up with seats on important standing committees uh, of city council or even on the executive policy committee. What happens with the Executive Policy Committee remains to be determined because uh, one of Scott Gillingham's campaign pledges was to reduce the number of councillors who, who sit on the EPC so that the EPC is no longer uh, a majority faction of council um, and can get its agenda through council uh, more readily because all its members form a majority on council. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, I love the fact that when you told me uh, the day before the election that uh, Sean's um, 
reception uh, was going to be held uh, at his mother's home. I just thought that was uh, that was really cool. Uh, in a, an age when people rent out big halls or tend to go to uh, restaurant lounges or sort of common meeting areas in order to have huge expensive parties, uh, he had a few friends and family over and uh, obviously crucial campaign workers and supporters and uh it was a, a nice little gathering at his mom's house and did you told me on the night you were the first reporter there i was the first reporter there yes i was the first one in the house and uh after we spoke and took our photos and everything uh as i was leaving there was a few reporters kind of lined up uh outside the door but yeah i guess uh kind of st staking out the neighborhood waiting for the numbers to come in uh paid off Cool. Uh, very cool. And uh, it was a good job and a good story. Um, now, moving on from uh, the civic election and its fallout, uh, we obviously there was other news and other stories that uh, are in the November 2nd edition of the West. Uh, November 2nd issue of the West edition of the Free Press Community Review. That's a mouthful sometimes. And one of them, the cover story, as a matter of fact, is uh, on a new Filipino restaurant uh, moving into Rafi's Cafe at the southeast corner of Wall Street and Ellis Avenue. It's right in my neighborhood. And uh, the new place is called Kiko's Grill, I believe. Tell me a little more about it. Exactly. So Kiko's Grill is uh, named after the barbecue master of the restaurant. Um, he is one of three people who own the restaurant. They're all longtime friends. And so his job is kind of to make their signature barbecue dishes uh, they're known for. Um, basically, this restaurant, um, the three business partners, they had previously run um, like a ghost kitchen out mm -hmm. of an, another place. Um, but when this opportunity came up at Rafi's Cafe um, to create this restaurant that does like dine in uh, takeout as well as like big catering orders, uh, they jumped at the opportunity. And um, yeah, their kind of main goal with the restaurant is to serve up um, like traditional, like authentic Filipino food. Um, all three owners were born in the Philippines and um, two of them immigrated around a decade ago to Winnipeg. And um, one of the folks, uh, he's been living in Winnipeg since a child, since he was a child. But um, obviously this uh, cuisine is very important to them, a big part of their lives. And they wanted to share it with the West End neighborhood in kind of a big way. Um, so it's kind of funny because all three of them live in Transcona, but um, they chose the West End for for this business and they have plans to open up other locations in the city if uh, things work out well here. So it's kind of well, neat. They're there. Uh, they're there pretty much every day of the week and they'll do like they'll have the kitchen running while the music's happening at Rafi's Cafe. So it's a bit of like a during the day dine in place and then a bit of like a late night uh, restaurant as well. That's kind of cool. Um, did they give you a sense of, of what business has been like right off the top? Apparently, it's been really great. Um, they said uh, when um, they're doing the um, like in-house uh, cooking for Rafi's Cafe, they said that's when the action happens. Um, so I think they've been enjoying uh, the live music aspect of it. But they've been having um, really great success with um their large delivery orders doing like baby showers um so a little bit of socials but just like large gatherings um they kind of specialize in doing these like massive orders um one of the owners was telling me they catered up to like it was like 300 servings of food like in one day so yeah they're a well-oiled machine for sure Oh, very cool. Yeah, the uh, that's interesting that uh, a lot of their um, business is uh, these massive sort of catering things because uh, and it makes sense to me now why they would if they live in Transcona take the uh, this kitchen opportunity that's available to them because it's rare to get into a commercial kitchen like that. If you're a ghost kitchen, you usually have to to rent the space and, and build it yourself. But if you can go into a, a, a commercial kitchen that's already set up, then half the battle's over and uh, you're not worried about logistics, you just do the work. And the Filipino community, as, as we all know, is very close and is all about family and family gatherings and community 
community gatherings that are either church related or uh, often geographically related. People from various parts of the Philippines uh, form associations and and get together on a regular basis in the city. And so it's cool that Kikos has this business. Now it's all in my name. It's in my neighborhood, as I mentioned. And I'm very curious. Um, a favorite dish of mine is tosalog, which is uh, essentially a Filipino breakfast with a an egg and uh, a, a very tasty uh, piece of barbecued pork. So I'm going to have to go and try the tosalog at uh, at Kikos. Definitely. Thanks for telling us about it. Um. OK, uh, we're looking ahead now. Uh, next week's uh, a short week because the Remembrance Day holiday falls on Friday, November 11th. And uh, that means uh, we're going to be compressing five days work into four around here, but we'll still get papers out ready for the issues of uh, November 9th and November 16th. What are you working on for the issues of November 9th? So tomorrow I am going down to this very newly opened or it's about to open. I think the owner is just putting the final touches on a cat cafe in the West End. Um, so cafe. some, yeah, so some folks might be familiar with um, uh, Jen Jennifer LaFerrier and her cat cafe that was in East Kildonan on Henderson Highway that she's been operating for a number of years, cat, ca cat cafe slash adoption center. Um, I had known for a while she was looking for some bigger digs for the cats, um, something that just gives people a bit more space to mingle with the animals, get to know them before they adopt. Um, so she found um, a new location on the in the West End. I believe it's on Wall or Aaron. Um, you'll have to read the story uh, to double check that. But um, yeah, she found a bigger space, is like almost done all the renovations. And hopefully there's some cats in there tomorrow when I go. But um, yeah, it's cool to see the business kind of take, take its next step. I think it had kind of outgrown um, the Henderson space. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jennifer is uh, a community correspondent for us, actually, and uh, writes about 10 times a year for uh, the West edition of the Community Review and has done for years. Um, she uh, is the lucky recipient of, uh, of a kidney transplant and has written about that over the past uh, many years for us uh, at CanStar. And uh, it's really cool that uh, the cat guy idea has taken off to the extent that she's looking for larger premises. Although I'm a little concerned about the fact that there's going to be a cat cafe in my neighborhood, if you say it's on Aaron and Wall, because uh, that may mean another furry creature somehow ends up at my house and I'll just have to say, oh, sure. So um, we'll see how that how that goes. Thanks for telling us about it, and uh, thanks for doing this with me today. Um, before we go, I just want to remind our readers and our viewers that we do this every week, and we post the weekly video update every Wednesday at five o'clock on the CanStar website, which is simply www.canstarnews.com, as well as online uh, on our YouTube channel, which is simply CanStar Community News. So thanks for this, Caitlin. Take care, and we'll see everyone next week.